Now, the various international dispute resolution pathways which I just outlined complement the fact that Singapore is one of the most connected countries strategically located along major trade, maritime and aviation routes. Singapore is also the gateway to Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia which provides convenient access to the region. For example, Singapore is connected to the rest of the world by an international airport that sees rapid air traffic resurgence with the recent reopening of our borders. Now, you may wish to know that there are four terminals now in Changi Airport. Terminal 4 or T4, which has reopened this month, has a handling capacity of 16 million passengers a year. And when the southern half of the Terminal 2 reopens next month, Changi Airport's handling capacity will be restored to its pre-COVID-19 level of 70 million passengers a year. This will ensure that Singapore as a global aviation hub can meet the increasing demand for air travel as more countries reopen their borders. In the horizon is a Terminal 5, which is actually a combination of size of T1 to T4, right? so it's a very big term terminal. When completed in mid-2030s, that Terminal 5 alone can handle 50, 50 million passengers. Now, the increased airport capacity will cater to a fast-expanding middle class in this region. Singapore is also a major maritime port in our time zone. During the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw seaports in other countries experiencing closures, severe congestion and long delays, our port has remained open 24-7. Throughout as the catch-up port, where vessels made up time for delays elsewhere. In 2021, Singapore handled a record high of 37.5 million 20-foot equivalent units TEUs of containers. Now that kept our position as the world's busiest transshipment hub. Now we now have this new port called the Tuas Port, which consolidates all port operations at a single venue. And it's been done in phases. There are three more phases now to develop this port. When fully completed around 20 years from now, the Tuas Port will be able to handle 65 million TEUs annually. And that's almost double today's volume. This will position Singapore as a leading global player in the maritime space. And due to this strategic location of ours, Singapore provides unparalleled access to all businesses in the world, making it a leading financial hub in the continent. According to the 2022 Global Financial Centres Index, the GFCI, Singapore is one of the top 10 financial centres in the world. And just this month, Singapore has launched the Financial Services Industry Transformation Map, the ITM 2025, which lays out the growth strategies to further develop Singapore as a leading international financial centre in Asia. Beyond air, sea and global markets connectivity, Singapore's internet connectivity is amongst the world's highest. According to Statista's research on internet penetration in Singapore, around 88.5% of the Singapore population were using the internet in 2020. Not as if we have much of a choice during COVID times, right? What can you do? Play with the internet. Now, by 2025, this figure is projected to grow to more than 93%. A large proportion of the population in the country access the internet through their mobile devices. Just now, show of hands, we've all got an iPhone each. Right? And as of the third quarter of 2020, 98% of the total population own a digital device in the form of a smartphone. Internet users in Singapore spend on average 8 hours of daily internet use, mostly for personal purposes such as entertainment, online shopping. So those of you who are in the e-commerce e business can immediately see the vast potential of the Singapore market. Next slide, please. Now, Singapore has been known for its relatively robust economy since attaining independence in 1965. Although many businesses in Singapore, like elsewhere globally, were not spared the scourge of COVID-19 in the past two years, our economy has remained largely resilient. As at August this year, Singapore's GDP growth forecast for 2022 is 3 to 4%. I mean, all things considered, it's not you know, a very low figure. With prudent policies and faster vaccination, our economic recovery has been relatively swift. 
and new growth sectors and business models are emerging amidst the strategic direction to innovate. One of the high growth factor, sectors in Singapore is the financial sector. According to a speech by the Managing Director of MAS, the financial sector performed strongly throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, growing by an annual average of 7.2% during 2020 to 2021. The last two years also saw about 5,800 net jobs created in financial services. And growth has been broad based across banking, insurance, asset management and payment services. For example, in private markets, Singapore's private equity and venture capital ecosystem is providing smart capital and business networks to the rapidly expanding pool of growth companies here and across the region. We now have a steady ecosystem of startups, tech talent and funding. Tech startups based in Singapore raised some 11.2 billion Singapore dollars in the first nine months of last year. And Singapore is now home to over 50 global and regional innovation labs and more than 1,400 fintech firms. Leading players at the forefront of digital asset innovation have also anchored their operations in Singapore. Now in wealth management, Singapore's thriving family office ecosystem is helping wealthy Asian families to professionalize the management of their wealth and support their growing interests to invest for impact. The number of family office here jumped fivefold between 2017 and 2019 and almost doubled from 400 in 2020 to 700 in 2021. IMAS has since announced stricter criteria around assets under management, local investments and business spending for family office to qualify for tax incentives. Now, I will not go into the details, but according to a Business Times report published a month ago, Indonesia's newly minted technopreneurs are increasingly eyeing to establish family office in Singapore. And many affluent Indonesian families are reported to have set up charity foundations in Singapore to invest in eco-friendly projects. Indeed, the newest and possibly most promising area of growth is sustainable finance, where Singapore aspires to support Asia's transition to a low-carbon economy. Singapore is also developing strategies to build a comprehensive ecosystem for green and transition financing. Now, all these strategic directions are set to build new engines of growth for the Singapore economy. Next slide, please. Singapore's pro-business environment actually can be experienced from the point of starting a business. It is relatively easy and quick to register a business in Singapore. The registration process is fully digitalized and can be completed online. It is bureaucracy free, efficient, without the need for tons of documents and support. It typically takes no more than three days to incorporate the company in Singapore if the relevant application has been duly completed and no other regulatory approvals are required. Business in Singapore may be conducted through a variety of business structures from limited liability companies to sole proprietorships. The factors which determine which business structure to choose would include the legal status of the structure, the extent of the owner's liability, funding requirements, tax considerations, and future expansion plans. Now, a positive feature of doing business in Singapore includes audit exemption for the small company. A company qualifies as a small company if it is a private company, in the financial year in question, and it meets at least two of three following criteria for immediate past two consecutive financial years. So this means to have a total revenue of up to 10 million Singapore dollars, total assets of up to 10 million Singapore dollars, or up to 50 employees. Generally, foreign entities and individuals can own 100% of a Singapore incorporated company. As such, business owners can establish a Singapore company with the preferred capital structure. They can bring capital from other countries to invest in Singapore businesses. Authorised capital requirements are not required. In short, the business owner is generally free to issue and own shares with minimal intervention. And there can be free movement of foreign currencies without exchange controls on the remittance or repatriation of capital or profits in or out of Singapore. 
In general, the Singapore government maintains a level of oversight and control over foreign direct investment in the form of legislative restrictions or licensing regime. Now, some of the sectors with more stringent oversight and control would include real estate, broadcasting, domestic media, financial services and banking, and professional services. Even in these sectors, the government generally promotes a consultative approach between the foreign investors and the regulatory bodies, where each application is assessed on a case-by-case -case basis on its merits. There are also various governmental incentives and schemes to encourage foreign investments in Singapore. Examples would include the Pioneer Certificate Incentive, the PCI, and the Development and Expansion Incentive, the DEI, which encourage companies to grow capabilities and conduct new or expanded economic activities in Singapore. Companies that carry out global or regional HQ activities of managing, coordinating and controlling business activities for a group of companies may apply for these schemes. An approved company under the PCI or DEI is eligible for corporate tax exemption or a concessionary tax rate on income derived from qualifying activities. Now, entrepreneurs and business owners who are interested in relocating to or investing in Singapore can also consider the Global Investor Programme, the GIP. Now, this programme accords Singapore permanent resident status to eligible global investors who intend to drive their businesses and investment grow from Singapore. Applicants will need to have substantial business track record and successful entrepreneurial background to qualify. There are four categories of persons who are eligible to apply, namely established business owners, next generation business owners, founders of fast growth companies and family office principals. And depending on the category, the qualifying criteria and investment requirements do differ. Next slide, please. Singapore also has a business-friendly tax regime. Our tax structure is relatively straightforward. Corporate entities, that is, companies incorporated in Singapore and foreign corporations with registered branches in Singapore, are currently taxed at a fixed corporate income tax rate of 17% of chargeable income accruing, derived or received in Singapore. Unless their businesses qualify for tax relief or enjoy concessionary tax benefits under various legislations. Now, Singapore adopts a single tier corporate tax system, which means that dividends distributed to shareholders are tax exempted in Singapore. Unless otherwise exempted, income tax is generally payable on gains or profits. Now, tax exemption schemes are available for new startup companies and partial tax exemption scheme for companies. The startup tax exemption was introduced to help provide newly incorporated qualifying companies to grow and establish themselves. All new startup companies are eligible for the tax exemption scheme, except companies whose principal activity are that of investment holding or companies that undertake property management for sale, investment, or both. Now, the new startup company must be incorporated in Singapore, be a tax resident of Singapore for the year of assessment, and meet other criteria on shareholding. There is also the partial tax exemption scheme introduced to help maintain Singapore's competitiveness by alleviating the tax burden of less profitable businesses in Singapore. Now, all companies are eligible for this partial tax exemption unless they are claiming the tax exemption for new startup companies. Now, in Singapore, we also have the Goods and Services Tax, the GST, similar to value-added tax or the VAT in some jurisdictions. Now, it is compulsory for businesses to register for GST when their turnover in the past four quarters exceeds or is expected to exceed in the next 12 months, 1 million Singapore dollars. Now, the prevailing rate for GST is 7%. By January 2023, there will be an increase of 1%, percent will be 8%. And then by 2024, January, there will be an increase of another percent, 9%. So if you want to do your shopping, better try to do it before 2023 and 2024 in Singapore. All right? Now, even at 9%, our GST rate is considered low amongst jurisdictions that impose the similar VAT. Now, there are also other taxes, right, such as property tax, stamp duty, withholding tax and all that. I think given the confines of time, I will not go into it. Suffice to say that the tax regime in Singapore is not prohibitive. They are relatively transparent to foreign investors 
the desire to set up business or invest here. Now, next slide. Singapore's workforce is generally considered highly educated and skilled. Now, Singapore government invests in continuous training of the workforce so that it remains responsive to evolving business needs and advancements in technology. Now, in the 2021 INSEAD Global Talent Competitiveness Index, Singapore is ranked second in the world. And this index noted that Singapore is one of the world's best pools of vocational and technical skills and is the world's best performer in regulatory landscape, formal education, employability and high-level skills. All foreigners who intend to work in Singapore must have a valid pass before they can start work. The type of work pass depends on, among other things, the professional qualification, skill level and monthly salary. All right? So just to recount, there's the entree pass, there's the employment pass and foreign Entrepreneurs and investors who are interested to set up a long-term base in Singapore can consider the GIP, the Global Investor Program I mentioned just now, by applying for Singapore Permanent Residence. Now, just to highlight that from next year onwards, we've got a new work pass system called the Overseas Network and Enterprise, the One Pass. And that's introduced to attract top foreign talent with valuable networks and deep skills and expertise from across all sectors. This one pass has a long duration of five years. It provides the pass holder the flexibility of playing multiple roles in Singapore's economy. And this means that successful applicants of one pass can start, operate and work for multiple companies in Singapore at the same time. Now to qualify, applicants will need to earn a fixed monthly salary of at least 30,000 Singapore dollars. And that's comparable to the amount earned by the top 5% of employment pass holders. Next slide. Now, by now, I hope you have a slightly clearer picture of why Singapore is a place to be considered seriously for doing business and that doing business there actually is not as difficult as some of you may have thought initially. I've also outlined the abundance of growing opportunities in Singapore and between Indonesia and Singapore. The logical next question then is how do we, SIP and Don Burke, fit in this overall scheme of things. Now, the short answer is that our law firms can work together to help you on the legal, regulatory and risk management aspects so that you can focus on the business aspects with greater peace of mind. Next slide, please. Now, it is then the portion for me to just briefly introduce my firm, Don Burke. Now, ours is a heritage law firm with coming to 150 years of history. Yes, 150, and that will be in 2024. Established in 1874 by UK expatriates, it is now Singapore's oldest independent law practice. Our firm has literally lived through the era of several UK monarchs from Queen Victoria in the 19th century till King Charles III at present. Right, very long time. And the firm has witnessed Singapore's history from a British colony in the Strait Settlements to Japanese occupation to being part of Malaysia and finally the Republic of Singapore. In 2024, we will be celebrating the firm's 150 years. It is befitting that our office will be relocated to the Singapore Land Tower and you will have the privilege of seeing the architect's design. Can I have the next slide, please? In the next slide. So it will be newly refurbished and uh, occupy the 14th floor of Singapore Land Tower where you can see a little bit of the Marina Bay Sands. All right, so that will mark the transition of our firm to, a, to the firm's history. Now, over the years, our firm has earned a strong reputation for integrity, industry and astuteness in advancing and protecting clients' best interests by looking beyond narrow legal issues towards realizing our clients' total business goals. I think just now you heard Park Yuda introduce you know, SIP. In many respects, Domberg has a lot in parallel with SIP law firm. Now, our firm now has a total strength of about 70 lawyers and staff, and we have four main practice groups, uh, intellectual property practice, corporate and commercial practice, disputes and specialist practice, and the real estate practice. Many of our services actually mirror those of SIP law firm if you actually compare, making us very fitting strategic partners. 
Now, besides having corporate presence for IP work in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, we also have a dedicated Indonesia desk and strategic alliances with local law firms such as GJC Law, uh, that's Miss Gloria James Law Firm, and other eminent law practices in ASEAN, China and Australia. Now, I'm not going to bore you with details of our practice. All right, I will come to the concluding part of the remarks. Now, SIP law firm's motto is, every step is worship. This deeply meaningful motto has resonated with me since I was first introduced to SIP by Pak Yuda in August 2019 at an event when I was in Jakarta on a Singapore Law Society mission. Can we have the next slide, please? All right, so you can see there the banner, right, the Singapore Law Society mission. So that was August 2019. Then Pak Yuda paid a courtesy visit to Donaldson Birkinshaw, our office. You can see the Friends Forever photo. All right, so that was in October in 2019. I then paid a courtesy visit to SIP in February 2020 and received the warm welcome and kindness of Ibu Safitri. The rest, as they say, is history. Now, three years have since fleeted by from 2019. There are now so many challenges and issues in the world, from severe climate change to geopolitical tensions. But our two firms' common core values and that of doing our utmost best for clients whom we serve will not and must not change, come what may be the challenges. It is my hope that SIP and Don Burke will take every step together as trusted strategic partners to help our clients navigate safely to their preferred destination and achieve their goals in an uncertain world. Today, 148 years of Donberg plus 11 years of SIP equals almost 160 years of lawyering wisdom. Our clients can count on this collective wisdom and more to come as we progress together. Now, on this note, I thank you all for gracing this event and hope to be able to speak with each of you later this evening. And once again, thank you, SIP Law Firm. To be a foreign counsel is a huge personal honour. Thank you very much indeed.